All right, so let's drive the Fourier series today. And we will drive this Fourier series using orthogonal functions. So a vector is no more than an abstract thing. It is an ordered list of values, each of which are paired to an index. But the interesting thing is that we can look at it from the richly intuitive perspective of geometry without any loss of generalization. In other words, we can think of vectors as arrows residing in some space that consists of a weighted sum of smaller arrows. If we have a vector v, then we can represent it as the linear combination of a set of n basis vectors. However, these n basis vectors are not necessarily orthogonal, but we could also represent it as a set of m orthogonal basis vectors. And these two uh, basis vectors are, are related through the through what we call the change of basis matrix. And now I will feed your imagination by building a critter using vectors. This critter will have a certain physical characteristics that can be completely described with a set of four different animals, specifically the cat, dog, ostrich, and zebra, each of which are associated with a, um, a number that describes the degree to which the creature is similar to that of the corresponding animal. And I will call this creature the docks. So in an abstract geometrical way, we can represent the docks as a single vector that resides in a particular subset of what we will call animal space. And as revealed, as revealed by the orthogonal basis vectors, right over here, this space that we're working in is actually three-dimensional. And here we have chosen a specific set of basis vectors, but theoretically, there could actually be an infinite number of basis vectors. And if we're talking about like orthogonal basis vectors, then these different sets are actually related through, um, through rotation of the space, which is pretty interesting, and scaling of the vectors as well. And so I realized that this, um, some parts of this example may not, may not make complete sense, but I think you understand what I'm trying to say here. And the reason why I want to get this, um, and the reason why I'm doing this is to get the creative side of the brain, uh, you know, ruling. And this is because in order to create the Fourier series, we kind of need to be creative and apply the concept of vectors to something that is used uh, you know, to other things, uh, you know, particularly something that is used in math that begins with an F and ends with an N. So this thing in math that I was talking about earlier that begins with an F and ends with an N is function. And I know it may sound strange, but we can represent any function with a single vector that points in a single direction in either finite or even infinite dimensional space, depending on the function and the basis vectors that, are, that you use to, rep to represent the function. And just to give you a little intuition about why this is the case, if we have some arbitrary single input, single output function displayed here, which we will call f of x, then in some interval from a to b, we can sample values from the function as regular intervals of width delta x. And then we can use this ordered list of values extracted from the function to create a vector. And each of these values will be associated with a basis vector, each of which will be, each of which will define, sorry, <laughs> each of which we, we will define to be orthogonal to one another. So if we follow the same process in the limit as delta x approaches zero, uh, whoops, hold on a minute. You can see that the vector now contains all of the information that is present in the function in the form of a single arrow that points in infinite dimensional space, which is pretty mind boggling. So now that we know a function can be a vector, we can express it as the sum of orthogonal basis functions. And there can be uh, many different types of orthogonal basis functions that we could use. Many different types that are possible. 
And so one thing I forgot to mention is that um, the type of basis functions that we used uh, in the last slide were what we call the natural basis functions. And these are an infinite set of orthonormal functions, uh, you know, orthogonal functions that are also of magnitude one, uh, that are defined as shown in the green math text thing. <laughs> and this can potentially lead, potentially lead to a way to approximate a function, as well as a way to decompose it into simpler components. But first, let's review what it means for two vectors to be orthogonal or perpendicular. It means that if we have two vectors, which we will call u and v, which are composed of a linear combination of orthogonal basis vectors, then the inner product, also known as the dot product, must be equal to zero. So if we want to express a vector as a linear combination of orthogonal basis vectors, then we first need to define the inner product. Next, we need a set of orthogonal basis vectors in which the inner product between different vectors in the set is zero, whereas the inner product of one of the vectors with itself is the square of the magnitude of the vector. And finally, we can express some vector q as a linear combination of the n basis vectors. And something very important to note here is that, um, you know, especially if we want to do the same thing with functions, is that first we need to define the inner product. It all depends on this one step. And now we will attempt, we will attempt to take the inner product between two functions. So if we want to take the inner product between functions f and g, then we first need to know how many orthogonal components each vector has. Or, you know, how many of these natural basis functions do we need to get the total vector? And so in order to do this, we need to define an interval over which we will sample the functions to obtain these vectors, as well as the sampling frequency. And so what we're going to do is that we will take samples every delta x over the interval from x is equal to a to x is equal to b. It then follows that we have a total of b minus a over delta x of these samples, meaning that we will have b minus a over delta x orthogonal components, or you know, that many of these natural basis functions within our vectors. And as you can see, I added some rectangles to the sigram. And it's because it helps to see why we have a b minus a over delta x of these samples. It's because each sample corresponds with a rectangle. And so we have that many rectangles, meaning that we have that many samples. It's just kind of like a visual aid. But then what about the rest of the expression? Well, we would just do what we do with any other vector, right? All right, so there we go. We just added um, f of a plus i delta x multiplied by the complex conjugate of g of a plus i delta x into the equation. And of course, let's not forget to take the limit as delta x approaches zero. And there you have it. That's your inner product, right? Well, not exactly. You may notice that this sum will diverge to infinity, maybe except for a few cases, but it still tends to do that. So actually, this definition isn't very useful, especially when we want to compare lengths or magnitudes of the different vectors extracted from the different functions which would just be the square roots of the inner product of a given function with itself. To reiterate this problem, we know that we can determine the magnitude of a vector by taking the inner product with itself, which means that we take the sum of the squared magnitudes of all of the orthogonal components, that is assuming that all components are real. However, if we try to do this, then we will just get infinity every time because we're summing an infinite number of components. But then again, we know that the sort of rates at which different functions approach infinity is different. So we need to set up the inner product 
in such a way that we can distinguish one magnitude of a function from another. Think of it as a standardized way to measure the magnitude of a function, which we now know can be represented as a vector. So again, what is the solution to this problem? Well, if we have a set of orthogonal vectors, we can scale each vector by some factor and still maintain the orthogonality. And as long as we know the set of factors by which we scale the orthogonal set of basis vectors, all of the information that we extracted from the function remains intact. So we can actually scale each orthogonal component of the vector by any factor we want, but we want each term to involve the multiplication of a different quantity, specifically our delta x that we already have here. Because we can think of the dot product as a sum of differential rectangles, aka an integral. And just for simplicity, we will actually multiply each component by the square root of delta x, as shown right over here. And this will actually change the inner product. And I think you know where I'm going with this. And this will change the inner product because each function is scaled by the square root of delta x. So this will be our new inner product. Actually, we haven't really changed the vectors that we that were extracted from f of x and g of x. Instead, the inner product makes this change for us. So this inner product is kind of like a machine that kind of squishes down these vectors and turns it into something that is finite instead of infinite. So essentially, we have defined the inner product such that it takes two vectors of infinite magnitude, squishes each orthogonal component down into an infinitesimal piece by multiplying it by a factor of the square root of delta x, and then it takes the normal dot product, or you know, inner product, between two functions. And so that's what it does. So if we look at this inner product closely, then we may recognize it as a very special type of summation called an integral. Specifically, it is the integral from x is a to x is b of f of f of x multiplied by the complex conjugate of g of x right there. Cool. And so here is the inner product in its final form. And we will use this inner product for the rest of this video. But I just wanted to make a note right over here that we didn't really have to choose to squish each vector by the square root of delta x. Instead, we could have squished each orthogonal component of the functions by any factor we want, such that the product of these factors is what we will call the weight function, w of x, multiplied by delta x, which then turns into dx when we convert it into an integral. And so now we have this inner product, and we will define two functions to be orthogonal if this inner product is equal to 0. And so we can also use this same inner product to define what we will call the norm of a function. And it's just the magnitude of the function as a vector. And this magnitude will, will be equal to some constant, which we, which we will call d. At this point, we see that a function can be represented as a linear combination of orthogonal basis functions with respect to the inner product that we chose. So we can choose any set of valid orthogonal basis functions to represent the function. So which basis set do we want to use? We could use the natural basis functions, as we defined earlier. But what about other basis sets, perhaps one that is more intuitive and easy to work with? Hmm. However, we want to be careful in choosing a basis set, because, you know, just because a set of functions are orthogonal doesn't mean that they form a basis. In fact, if we want to represent any arbitrary, any, <laughs> not arbitrary, arbitrary function, we need to an infinite set of orthogonal basis functions. But strangely, even sometimes this isn't even enough. We need to add a special ingredient to a recipe, if you will. And this ingredient will be covered on the next slide. So what is this missing ingredient? 
Well, it's something that we call completeness. Let's explain this a bit. So with functions, you have an infinite dimensional space that you need to cover. A given function may be fully represented with either a finite or infinite set of orthogonal basis functions, depending on the function and the basis functions that were chosen. Even with an infinite number of orthogonal functions, it may still not be enough to form a basis for a function because you need to cover all of the space. Uh, and, and this is because in order to completely characterize this space, you need even and odd functions because those are the two categories within this infinite set. In order to complete the infinity, you need both even and odd. As I was saying previously, there are two types of functions that are needed to describe the complete set of all functions within the function space. You need even functions, which are functions such that, um, so if f of x is an even function, then f of x is equal to f of negative x. And you also need odd functions. So if g of x is an odd function, then it must be that it must be so that <laughs> that g of negative x is equal to negative g of x. So we have the even and odd functions. So if we have some function h of x, then we can break it down into the sum of an even component and an odd component. The even part is h of negative x plus h of x over 2, and it satisfies the property that all even functions possess. And the odd component is negative h of negative x plus h of x over 2, and it satisfies the property common to all odd functions. Note that the sum of even and odd components simplifies to h of x. This is what we call the even-odd decomposition of a function. And so you may be wondering why this is really important. And it's because you can obtain any even function from a linear combination of even functions and any odd function from a linear combination of odd functions. Note that we say a linear combination. That's going to be important. So over here, we will prove that a linear combination of a set of even functions must also be an even function. So if we have a set of even functions indexed by i, f i of x, then if we take the linear combination of those even functions, h of x, then h of x must be an even function. And here we will prove that the linear combination of a set of odd functions must also be an odd function. So if you have a set of odd functions indexed by i, f i of x, then the even, oh, sorry, <laughs> not even, then if you have a linear combination of those odd functions, h of x, then h of x, h of x must also be an odd function. So we need a basis set that consists of an, e, of an infinite number of even and odd functions. We can approximate a function over an interval using a linear combination of a complete set of orthogonal basis functions and these functions are orthogonal with respect to a given inner product. And you know, we both we need both uh, you know <laughs> even and odd functions to completely characterize this space of functions, function space. And we want these orthogonal functions to satisfy three criteria. Um, we want the so, so we need an orthogonal sets of even basis functions to represent the even parts of the function that we want to um, decompose. We need a set of odd basis functions that are orthogonal to represent the odd components of the function that we want to represent. And additionally, we want all combinations of pairs of functions in which one is taken from the even set and the other from the odd set to be orthogonal as well just to keep things consistent. So which functions should we actually use? Well, I'll give you a hint. <laughs> Sorry, not a hint, <laughs> a hint. So, um, so Nikola Tesla, 
you know, the guy who invented all these electrical inventions, which is pretty cool. He said that you want to think of the universe in terms of frequencies and vibrations. That should be your hint right there. And finally, we have the big reveal. We can use sines and cosines of different amplitudes and discrete multiples of what we will call the fundamental frequency to satisfy these three criteria that we mentioned on the previous slide. The advantage of doing this is that we can decompose a function into sinusoids of different frequencies and amplitudes. So we can think of the universe in terms of frequencies and vibrations, just as Nikola Tesla would want us to. <laughs> so therefore, using sines and cosines as basis functions can only represent cyclic functions. Oh yeah, so um, so if we use sines and cosines, then we can only represent periodic functions. That's going to be important. Um, so yeah, yeah, so like, the important thing to note is that their cyclic nature is preserved preserved through linear combinations, and I will show that on the next slide. So here we prove that a linear combination of a set of periodic functions must also be a periodic function with the same period. And the period, the period that we have is big T. So we have a periodic, periodic set of functions, f i of t, then a linear combination of these periodic functions, h of x will also be a periodic function. So to be more specific about the big reveal, uh, so at least for now, we will use sines and cosines of different amplitudes and integer multiples of what we will call the fundamental frequency, such that n can be any integer positive, negative, or zero. The even components of the basis be even consist of the cosines and the odd components of the basis be odd consists of the sines. The complete basis is therefore the union of be even and be odd. And all basis vectors or functions that were chosen uh, or, or functions were chosen such that they are all orthogonal to one another with respect to the inner product displayed here in orange. But later, I'll show you why um, we aren't actually going to use this basis, because we actually don't need all of it. It can be simplified, and I'll show you that soon. So one thing I, for I forgot to mention on the previous slide is that the capital T right there, under the 2 pi, um, as the denominator, is called the period of the function. And this is the amount of time it takes for the function to repeat itself. Uh, it represents the amount of time it takes for one complete cycle to pass. So um, on this slide, I'm going to show you that the basis vectors that we chose are indeed orthogonal with respect to the inner product that we chose. Um, and as you can see, all of the even cosines are orthogonal, all of the odd sines are orthogonal, and each and all of the cosines are orthogonal to all of the sines. And we can also see that the magnitudes of the cosines are all um, a sub n multiplied by the square root of t over 2 pi. Uh, and the reason why I'm saying square root is because um, the magnitudes are the square roots of the inner product of the function with itself. So that's where that square root is coming from. And the magnitudes of the sines are b sub n, oh, sorry, um, b sub n multiplied by the square root of t over 2 pi. And now we can express an arbitrary function f of t as the sum of even and odd components, which are expressed as a linear combination of the respective even and odd functions that we have chosen as our basis functions. So we have this expression for the Fourier series, but it can actually be simplified, and I'll show you how. We can break down the sum into the sum of all negative values of n plus the expression evaluated at n is equal to 0 plus the sum of all positive values of n. 
We then simplify the expression at n is equal to 0 to c sub 0, multiplied by a sub 0. And we also do a little trick where we convert the summation over negative n values to a summation over positive n values by substituting negative n into the expression that we are summing, which then simplifies to this over here. So upon rearranging the expression, we obtain this over here. And as you can see, we end up not even using the, uh, this you know, huge part of our basis corresponding to the values of n from negative infinity to negative 1. We also have these groupings of constants that would be much easier to keep, to keep track of if we condense them down into a single constant. And this is exactly what we will do. We will simplify the boxed expressions, uh, you know, the expressions in the yellow boxes over here. Uh, yeah, the yellow boxes. <laughs> and in doing these steps, we are actually using a set a new set of basis functions uh, that is slightly different from the original set, and we will call this new set B prime. And here we have basis B in blue, which was the previous set that we used, and our new basis set B prime is displayed here in orange, and that is the set that we will use. And basis B prime is still orthogonal, but the sines and cosines have slightly different magnitudes, and they are all equal to one another. This magnitude is the square root of t over 2 pi. Um, because remember, the, the inner product of a vector with itself gives the squared magnitude, so we just take the square roots of that right there to obtain the magnitude. And so now we have the form of the Fourier series that we will use in terms of three constants, a0, a sub n, and b sub n. Uh, but how do we determine the values of the constants? So in order to do this, we take, the, we take advantage of the orthogonality of the basis functions within the summation. But it's easier to do this if we first convert the trigonometric Fourier series form that we have over here to the exponential form, uh, sorry, the complex exponential form. We will now proceed to convert the Fourier series from trigonometric form to complex exponential form. We begin by taking our trigonometric, uh, <laughs> trigonometric series and expressing the sines and cosines in terms of complex exponentials. And here's the expression that we receive as a result. And let's move this equation up here. That's better. Then we simplify by moving the constants to the outside of the parentheses, as shown over here. Then group the exponentials, as shown over here. Then we get rid of the imaginary number i and the denominator by multiplying the fraction by i over i, as shown over here. And we simplify the constants a little further. And now here's the clever part. We want to convert this expression that we have to the form of a constant multiplied by e to the i 2 pi i n t over capital T. But the problem is that we have the sum of a constant multiplied by positive i 2 pi i n t over capital T, and another constant multiplied by negative i 2 pi i n t over capital T. So somehow, we need to convert this negative sign into a positive sign. So what we're going to do is break down the sum into two parts, as shown right over here. And then we will flip the sign of n in the summation on the right so that we get a positive number in the exponential that matches the one on the left. But in doing this, 
uh, we are again changing the basis. So now we are changing from basis B prime to um, what we're going to call basis B double prime, which I'll show you later. So we are now using basis B double prime instead of basis B prime, because we are now using negative values of n. And that is the only difference between the two sets of basis vectors. And I know that I'm still using sines and cosines here instead of the complex exponentials. But this is actually because um, I still consider what we have so far the trigonometric series, uh, not yet the complex exponential series. Um, you know, it's because it's just expressed in a different way so far. So we're going to use this basis right now. So let's further simplify right over here. So now this is the step where we truly, we, we, we make the true transition from the trigonometric series um, to the complex exponential Fourier series. We will now transition to what we will, what we will call basis E instead of basis B double prime. And this basis, basis E, will consist of complex exponentials instead of sinusoids. And we know that this basis set of complex exponentials is complete because it consists of a linear combination of even and odd functions, as e to the i of theta is equal to cosine of theta plus i sine of theta. And the transition from the previous step, the transition from the previous step to the next step tells us, this tells us that there is a, re, there is a re relationship between the constants to use in the trig form of the Fourier series and the complex exponent and the complex exponential form of the Fourier series for each value of n. We see that the constants used in the complex exponential Fourier series, uh, the complex exponential form, which we will call um, c sub n, those are the constants, are related to the constants in the trig form as displayed on this slide. So let's rearrange this slide a bit. There we go. And there we have it. We have the Fourier series in its two different forms and the relations between them displayed right over here. We now have all the necessary information to solve for the constants of the Fourier series in both the trig and complex exponential forms. But let's begin with solving for the coefficients of the complex exponential form. But first, let's talk about the new basis that we are using for the complex exponential series. Um, as you may recall, uh, we call this basis uh, we call this basis basis E, and it consists of integer multiples of the fundamental frequency contained within a complex exponential. And as you can see here, these basis functions are orthogonal. These basis functions are orthogonal with respect to our inner product rights over here. Uh, in blue, that's not in the box. Um, so even though I, I already solved for and simplified the inner product be between each of the complex exponential basis functions, I still want to express the simplicity of the complex conjugates of the basis functions, uh, whoopsie, of the ex, oh, sorry, of the complex exponential form. So what are these complex conjugates? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, another thing I forgot to mention is that these basis functions are orthogonal with a norm equal to the square root of negative t. Or sorry, not negative t, the square root of the uh, of t, which is the period. All right, so again, what is the complex conjugate of the basis vectors? Uh, but the answer, uh, the answer to this question is pretty simple, actually. And I'll provide a simple explanation right over here. So in general, we have a complex number z if we have a complex number z, then it's, it's complex conjugates 
is just the same thing except with a negative sign in front of the imaginary parts of the number. Thus, if we follow the logic, then we see that the complex conjugates of a complex exponential is obtained by multiplying its input by negative 1. So we could say that the complex conjugates of our basis function is e to the negative i 2 pi nt over t. So let's make that simple but important simplification right over here in that red box. Given this information, we can now solve for c sub n. We will begin with the complex exponential Fourier series displayed in the yellow box. Then we will multiply both sides of the complex conjugates, oh, sorry, both sides by the complex conjugates of the basis functions indexed by a variable m, and then take the integral of both sides from t naught to t naught plus capital T, which is our interval over which the inner product is defined. All right, so then we will remove the parentheses right over here and proceed. Then on the right side of the equation, we move the summation and constants outside of the integral. Now using the orthogonality of our basis functions as displayed in the orange box, we may simplify the right side of the equation accordingly. So I already uploaded the video of this one, but I had to delete it because I made a mistake. And the mistake that I made was over here. I mistaked, um, so instead of a T, I put a one in the curly brace. So that messed up the calculations and I got the wrong answers, but now they are corrected. And so let's proceed. So at this point, uh, when you multiply by the curly brace on the right-hand side, what happens is that the C sub N turns into a C sub M multiplied by T and the summation actually goes away. And there we go. So we have finally solved for the values of C. These values are indexed by M, but since M is just an index variable, we could change it back to N to receive the final equation encased in the yellow box. So now that we have the values of C sub N, we could use this information to solve for the constants of the trigonometric Fourier series a sub n and b sub n. On this slide, we summarize the information that we have discovered so far. We will now proceed to solve for a sub n and b sub n using the values for c sub n. Now we have solved for a sub n and b sub n, and now all we need to do is simplify them using the following identities. And there you have it. Uh, you know, there you have it. You have the simplified forms for a sub n and b sub n of the trigonometric Fourier series. And here's a summary of everything that we discovered in this video. We derived both the trigonometric and complex exponential forms of the Fourier series, as well as the specific values of their coefficients. Now, before we conclude this video, there's one more thing I wanted to mention, and it is, we call the expression two pi over t the fundamental angular frequency, omega naught. And the fundamental frequency uh, is just 1 over the period t. And we call this frequency f. 
So that is everything right there. Pretty cool. Alright, so the video has come to an end. And that was definitely my longest video. But I'm very happy about the way it turned out. And, um, yeah, so thanks for watching. Stay tuned for the next video on how you could obtain the Fourier transform from the Fourier series. And remember to have a great day.